are going to be, today is really Axiom Award Day. Uh, and I want to really start by talking about Axiom next. We're going to get uh, <clears throat> presentations, five-minute presentations or so, from each of the nominees. And I want to really acknowledge how valuable it is, not just for our group here, but for the people that each of you represent that are, nom that are that have nominated and brought the nominations forward. Uh, there will be a voting at the end of today. That voting, actually, no, I'm sorry, the voting will happen with Slido.com at the end of these presentations prior to break. But each of the, and, the, and the, the awards will be presented later on this afternoon at the 4.30 session. But each of you who have um, invested so much time, energy, and people, process, technology, to be able to advance your own area, I just congratulations to, to each of you guys. Um, as we get going here, these are the seven uh, nominees, and then we're going to walk through, and each of them are going to come up here and, and, and tell us and share their story about asset management and what they've been doing in terms of advancing asset management in their agency. Uh, the process, let's kind of talk a little about process. So we've been playing with Slido. The show of hands, has everybody used Slido yet at the very first day? Have you found it to be kind of an engaging element? We're looking for a little feedback. Engaging, yes, no? Okay, kind of fun. Uh, we're going to be using that. A lot of times the results are showing up in live time, not on the award. The award voting will be private and they'll be compiled up, and then they'll be presented this afternoon. So uh, you won't see that. We'll probably see the number of votes that are coming in. So we will be using that at the end of the, this session here when we go into voting. There will be recognition, and I think very well-deserved recognition, by each, uh, to each agency for investing their time, energy, and sharing their story with us. Uh, there will be a popular vote winner, but everyone will be, will be receiving good recognition for what they're doing. When you go into thinking about the, you know, what it is that you value, here's the criteria that we ask you consider, right? So quantifiable. I mean, we live in a hard numbers world, right? I think that our presentations, both well, the presentation that Stuart provided on Tuesday, I very much value the economic drive to the value of trust. So it's not just lofty, good ideas. It actually delivers some performance on a financial level. I think that matters. And in the same way, the Axiom Awards, the more that we can quantify it, that's better to tell a story to be able to get the right level of investment and enthusiasm by the people who can support that, whether that's constituents, legislatures, funders, et cetera. So think in terms of the quantifiable business benefits. Um, also, customer value and satisfaction. Uh, we're really, you know, your whoever your presentation will share with us who that customer value is, you, oftentimes it gets right down to the agency and maybe the using with the driving public. So is it really getting all the way down to there? Can, can we talk about it broadly in, in the customer value sense? And does it bring innovation of how things have, uh, how they can be done now and into the future? Uh, and does it, does it bring innovation with ideas and technology or whatever? So those are the, the base criteria and then just you vote on what one you think is, uh, is, is the best. Pretty straightforward. OK. So with that, the, uh, the, first, the first agency, this is an alphabetical order. This is not an order of preference. Sorry, Alaska. I'm just, that's what it comes, that's what it comes with. So we've got the first one, Alaska. I think Dan is going to be coming up and sharing his information. So welcome, Dan, from Alaska DOT and Public Facilities. Thanks. So evidently, I'm stuck behind the podium, right? Uh, you, thank you. Thank you, you, you for letting No, we're fine. If you want to, uh, by the way, you can uh, take this off and, and walk if you would like. No, we'll, we'll stay here. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for having us down to Austin. Been a great time so far. Uh, Alaska DOT, um, one of our strategic initiatives right now is called Results-Based Alignment. Um, I threw our, our uh, company logo up there, the DOT logo. But this is also, uh, the picture below is a bad day for Brad and I. Brad is the fleet manager. I'm the maintenance manager, so things like this happen in Alaska. Some of the challenges we face. But I, I think the results-based alignment is a strategic initiative, but I think one initiative that I'd be remiss that I, if I didn't discuss is a one DOT initiative. By statute and by administrative code, 
we are, as a department, very disjointed. Those codes have not changed. We have a structure that makes it almost, we are, we are either at best uncooperative amongst the divisions or flat out adversarial. Those codes haven't changed, but the mindset of DOT has changed. So with my teammates, Brad and Drew, we work together as a team to be that one DOT to deliver that results-based alignment framework. And we're going to use Agile in the future, hopefully following Montana's guide, and, and deliver a great product to our team. So what products are we using from Agile? We're using the equipment maintenance system, the maintenance management system, and the pavement management system. Big driver to that is the decline in oil prices. Most of our general fund, unrestricted general fund budget comes from oil revenue. In fact, 90% of that comes from oil revenue. We pay no state tax in Alaska. We have very little incorporated boroughs or counties or parishes from Louisiana where property taxes are gathered. <laughs> so by state constitution, all of our schools, all of our roads, all of our airports are funded by oil revenue. So 90% decline in our unrestricted general fund budget here in the last three years with the decline in oil prices has left us in a quandary. We have a mess. So the declining budgets, but our investors are still demanding that return on investment from us as a department. What are we getting for our money? Well, in the past, we haven't been able to tell that story very well. And what we're going to in the future is going to be able to give us data, give us reports out of all these systems that can tell our stakeholders and our investors what we are actually delivering for the money that we are being provided. So again, we're investing in results. That RBA initiative is a, a balance between efficiency and effectiveness. Are we spending our money wisely? Are we affecting the most people that we possibly can with that money that we're working with? RBA is initiated on a three-level process statewide level, and then we have that mission statement, Keep Alaska Moving. Our next um, direct services come below that. We have four, um, excuse me, core services, four core services below that. Operate, maintain, preserve our infrastructure, and operate our marine highway system. Those are the four direct services. And then everything else in our department falls below that and rolls up to those four direct services. So in using that, we are, we are advancing technology. We are going to be using the mobile work manager. We're going to be using Esri Collector both for PMS collection and MMS for our reporting. And EMS has some great systems too as well to help us save money. So the timeline, we basically have uh, a request into our statewide security office that if we aren't ready to go by April 27th, we aren't going to go this fiscal year. That is the last hurdle, is getting statewide security to buy off on what we're trying to do. MMS, we're lagging a little bit behind, so we're hoping to deliver that by November. A huge achievement, though, and, and it's called PPIRO, and I wrote this out for myself, not for you guys, because I couldn't say it twice in a row without messing it up. So the, the initiative is parts purchase issued to a repair order. If you had a chance, or if you didn't have a chance, go back and review Brad and Golem's presentation from yesterday. They had a great 45-minute discussion on just what this does. It allows our um, frontline buyers to go ahead and buy parts directly from a supplier and attach that directly to a work order, saving probably 60,000 calculations or 60,000 entries at a minimum per year up to 260,000. So hundreds, if not thousands of hours of efficiency on the EMS side to help out. So the results we're delivering, we want to affect performance. We want to show that we are giving improvements to our transportation infrastructure. But we also want to make sure that our investors can invest more smartly. Looking down the road, if we need more money for our brush cutting or our drainage improvements, let's put our money there. And let's get that level of service to what our customers expect. We need to provide that the best asset performance that we can going forward for the, the money that we are being given, the funds we are being given. And the great part of the Agile system is the reporting feature. I can build a report right at my own desk instead of having to go and ask an analyst programmer to build it for me. I'm really looking forward to that. So we can easily share those results with our stakeholders. So 30,000 foot quick overview, but we are very excited moving forward and we hope that Maybe in two years, we'll be up here doing what Doug did the other day. Thank you.
I'm sure we will see you up here in a couple of years. Uh, Dan, that's great. Okay, City of Austin. Love it. Mr. Ed Poppett. Thanks. Good morning, all. Um, <clears throat> I applaud any of you that uh, got up and moved your assets this morning. I got my assets here just in time. <laughs> I'm not a morning person. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we installed a new pavement management system, um, and that was our first module from, uh, from Agile, uh, and that was uh, rolled out about two years ago, and we've been um, really uh, spinning the, the wheels on that pretty good. So. Um, we uh, have typical business drivers, which I'll do, uh, but uh, uh, I guess to connect that more directly to the citizens, um, we have a transportation user fee that is our income for, uh, for taking care of the streets. Uh, and so there's a direct connection between what the citizens are paying on a monthly bill and uh, the services that we provide, and so um, they expect to, to see a benefit for their for their uh, the fee that they're paying every month, um, and so um, performance measures to the reported to the public are important, uh, and uh, monitoring that condition of the of the infrastructure and assuring that it's in good shape. So our strategic goals are obviously mobility in, in any congested city, uh, making sure that the infrastructure is sound so that uh, folks can get around. And we're trying to get into asset management, in which, of course, having good project projections of your uh, network uh, conditions will assist greatly. Um, we, uh, using uh, all the typical technology for pavement management, there's nothing super magical there other than being able to have good analysis capabilities. So um, we uh, are now maintaining a five-year maintenance plan. Uh, so that's uh, really great for us to be able to try to optimize our funding over a longer period of time. And then uh, further, we're doing a 10-year analysis. So doing projections in the longer term is helping us. And one way that really helped us a lot was in being able to ask for increased funding. We showed that in the long term, we really needed to invest more in preventative maintenance and maintenance of the streets. So uh, in uh, this uh, coming year, we're hoping that, uh, that this will all get approved by council. But right now, it's, it's in all the drafts of the budget for us to get uh, $7 million more for preventative maintenance, most of which will go for overlays. And people are going to see a real benefit to the streets from that. Uh, overlays help us smooth the street out. Uh, we're going to continue to do as much aggressive uh, thin surface treatments as we've always done, make sure we keep up with that to preserve the value of the network. Uh, and then also in the bond program that's being considered, we were able to ask for a little bit more money. It's a modest increase, but we're competing against a lot of other uh, big public needs, uh, affordable housing, drainage, um, parks, facilities, uh, all kinds of uh, needs like that. So it's always tough for us to compete for the capital dollars. But we were able to get a little bit more than we've been getting before, so it's still a victory. Um, we're seeing a, a real benefit of being a SaaS uh, solution uh, uh, consumer, so we don't have any more calls to our IT department, which is great for us. I don't know about y'all, but sometimes it's difficult to, to stay friends with your IT departments, and so, so uh, Agile wants to be our friend, and they have been great to us, and so um, that relationship's been really good for us, so we really have enjoyed the, uh, the benefit of the uh, being a, a cloud solution uh, for the pavement management. Um, the big uh, thing I wanted to focus on for us as far as um, enhancements was the smart grouping idea. I did a presentation on that that a few of you saw and tried to explain the idea. Um, it's um, where we take the optimized results as, a, as a, a, an initial analysis and then combine those even further. And I've described it as slightly detuning the optimization, but in, in a way that allows us to do more efficient projects. Um, for example, a whole neighborhood might not get picked out for the same thin surface treatment or the same year, but we do another um, 
uh, phase of the analysis that tries to recombine those that so they were all these all pro projects were all picked out for this five-year window so we think that that's pretty much optimal optimal enough for us for the thin surface treatments but we can make them more efficient to produce and to get out on the streets uh, with contractors and with the citizens so everybody sees a consistent uh, job done in the neighborhood uh, if we can maybe accelerate a few uh, get them done uh, earlier or later uh, to combine them all. So that's the idea of the super sections is to uh, take these neighborhood groupings, which we've, we've uh, uh, highlighted throughout the city and uh, taken these big subdivision areas that have very similar characteristics um, and try to say, well, if almost every street in that area was picked for a seal code, but maybe some were picked for slurry seal, maybe a few for crack sealing. Let's just do the same thing to all of them because they probably all need about the same thing. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense to the citizens to see a consistent uh, treatment done. So we're, we're taking the, the optimization initially, which is getting us really into the ballpark we want to be in, then combining those as intelligently as we can into these bigger groups of saying, well, most of this area needed a certain thing, then we're going to do that to, to the entire area. The only exceptions are um, that I, I showed here that the major treatments are left alone. So if, the, if, if a certain street in the neighborhood or several streets in the neighborhood needed an overlay or rehabilitation or street reconstruction, we don't try to blend that in. This is just the thin surface treatments all being blended in together to uh, provide a consistent um, maintenance history for that area. And for the most part, it seems to make sense. Uh, and it also, I think, makes sense to the citizens. So that's, I think, uh, all I wanted to say. And so the smart grouping idea was kind of our, our innovation that uh, Agile helped us develop. And they built us an extra step in the analysis process to help us accomplish that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, Ed, Ed brought up a good point. A lot of these are really, the, the better you can tell a story, you've talked about picking up some additional funding, the $7 million, and, and not just, I mean, for your budget, that's a nice size amount right there. And so when you start thinking about how do you get your story across to those who are competing against you in terms of funding, and so that's a great, that's, that's a wonderful way. That's really what this is all about, is, is getting an, an authentic story to the people that can help us uh, advance infrastructure. Okay, <clears throat> Kentucky Transportation Cabinet. There, there's Chad right there. Longtime customer, appreciate you guys being here. Thank you, Chad. Okay, very good. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, what Joe just mentioned was, was, is a good, good lead-in for what I'm going to talk about. Um, we are also trying to spin a good story uh, for many people. Um, we've been trying to, to modernize our pavement management system for the, about the last four years. The, the main driving factor for that is to really promote our preventive maintenance program. Um, similar to, to, to what the City of Austin just said, we, we're really trying to uh, improve our network with, with you know, limited budget and really drive that preventive maintenance factor uh, across, our <coughs> excuse me, across our state. Um, so for us, um, you know, kind of the three main, three main components uh, to what we needed are pavement data um, and then de deterioration models and then a system to, to put all that together and provide some analysis. So, I'm oh, sorry, that's just the title. <laughs> um, we, we, we take care of the first part. You know, we, we collect all of our data. We're using a Mandalay so, uh, system with uh, the Pavementrix LCMS. So we have all this data. Um, but we didn't really know what to do with it or have anywhere, anywhere to put it and, and, and do anything with it to, for, you know, analysis or anything like that. So we uh, contracted with the University of Louisville. Um, so we, we wanted to match all of our historic data with, with this new system and, and new, new uh, many, many, many columns of, of, of cracking data and such. Um, so we have, you know, they're working on putting this pavement data in, into our system. And so then we needed the system to actually analyze that data, which is where Agile comes in. Um, so we, we just, uh, the Friday before we came here, we got our, uh, our 7.1 uh, pavement management system uh, with, with uh, the multi-constraint analysis to all put into our training software, our training, training environment. So I haven't had a chance to really play with it yet, but, but we're almost there. 
Um, so, uh, and Ting has been, been really good to us to get that in place. So thank you, Ting. Um, so we've got our, th our three parts now. We've not really had a chance to do a whole lot with it, but, but the goal is to then take all of our, our distress data that we're getting from automated collection, um, using some, uh, some tools with the University of Louisville, get that into a, a format we can input into our paper management system, perform a multi-year, multi-constraint analysis on that data with our new deterioration models that, that UofL also developed, and then output a work plan that can um, at, le at least tell us where to, to, to do these preventive maintenance treatments to most, get the most optimi optimized system we can. Um, one of our, our big issues recently has been a lot of pushback from the asphalt industry. Um, as you can imagine, if we're, if we're a state that does, you know, we have 95% asphalt pavements, uh, our, our history has been, you know, thin lay on, on all these pavements that need it, you know, whatever, whenever their time is up, 10 to 12 years, and we've marched on like that for 20 years. Um, as probably everybody in, in the room, our budgets have become more limited. The, uh, the amount of work we can get out of those budgets has become more limited. You know, we've not kept up with inflation. And so, so we're trying to, you know, put in place a preventive maintenance program, but uh, the asphalt in industry thinks we're taking money away from them, uh, which is not the case. We're actually trying to add money to the budget. Um, so, so all this, all this pavement management work uh, and pavement management, 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 excuse me, pavement management system work goes into telling this story to the contractors and to the public that no, we're not trying to, to take money away from you. We're actually trying to optimize the system. You're still gonna get your thin lays, but we're also trying to, to uh, tell a story to our, our, our budget people, our, you know, our legislature, that we really need more money for pre preventive maintenance. Um, and so that's, that's the main driving factor here. Uh, and I've got just a slide up here um, of some of the softwares and, and, and business drivers. Um, but, uh, our University of Louisville, the, 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 the cool thing that they're doing is, is they're actually, actually using um, um, sorry, neural networks to, to take our, our LCMS data and transform that into something we can put into our pavement management system. Uh, so they're really, uh, they've really done a lot, of, a lot of good work for us in that regard. A little bit of a timeline. We started in 2014. Uh, we got some preliminary models and processes from UofL in 2015. Uh, and then those were finalized in 2016. And then We've actually spanned uh, three platforms of PMS um, in that time period. We actually were still using the Power Builder system uh, as late as I think 2016. And at that point, it was really just a repository for data. Uh, we then moved into to, 6.8 with PMS, and then again, most recently to 7.1. So, so we're almost there with our software, and we're almost there with our, our models and, and deterioration data. So hopefully in, at the next conference, you'll, you'll hear me present about how this all turned out. But uh, in any case, uh, this is where we are currently. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Well done. All right. Very good. Um, well, the next presenter, David Corsi, with Louisiana Department of Transportation and Development. Louisiana's been a customer of ours for a long time. David's had quite a storied uh, uh, route inside of the DOA and DOTD. So please extend a very warm welcome for Mr. David Corsi. Good morning. Uh, first, I want to say thank you. That may be the closest I'll ever get to feeling like I'm bent on the prices right. So that's uh, the lifelong dream bucket list thing. Uh, secondly, shameless self-promotion, Alaska, I'd be happy to help y'all with Mobile Work Manager. My waiters and my fly rod and I would be happy to uh, come up and assist y'all in any way. My bosses are on the back row right behind y'all there. So, <clears throat> Okay, so uh, here we are. Let's uh, get down to business. So we want to talk to y'all a little bit today about our Mobile Work Manager implementation. Um, for those of us who don't know, um, we have been uh, an Agile customer for uh, eight years, nine years now, and we've run both the uh, asset management system and the mobile system in that entire, in that, for that entire time frame, rather. Uh, sorry, I'm used to pacing while I lecture, so if I back away and you can't hear me, that's gonna be on me. <clears throat> oh, excellent. Keep me from tripping and falling, this is great. All right, so uh, 
as I was saying, what we've found is that the devices that we use and the technology that we had in mobile, it's just lacking at this point. Honestly, it may have been lacking when we went up, but we had picked it years before that, and that's what we were going to go with. So what we want to see and what we want to work with is the idea of having on worksite access to our data. And what we want is greater accuracy for field information. When you go to pick an LRS ID or a location um, on the mobile device you have now, the difference between an accurate entry and an inaccurate entry can be a space. What we'd like to see is all of that listed in a drop down. Maybe even have that system make that selection for you based on where you are, based on a GPS reading. So those are the types of ideas we were working with. We want to eliminate paper processes. In my, uh, in my uh, discussion yesterday, I actually pointed out to someone that we had a, a group of people that were going out in the field and they were writing down all their work on work orders and then they were coming back to their office and they were picking up their mobile device and they were entering it in their mobile device while they were seated in their office. And then they would dock it and hit upload and send that into the system and then they would turn around and they would go into their computer and do all that. So we want to eliminate some of these duplications because a duplication is an opportunity for an error. We have every intent of moving forward with an LRS ID system that will recognize all of our individual linear assets. So uh, when you get into those choices, you get into quite a few options. We want to make sure that the system can, can identify those for us. Identify assets that we're maintaining. I've, I've been having a lot of fun testing this new mobile work manager in the field. It's been uh, real cool. And when you pull up to something that you hope it shows you and all of a sudden it just jumps right up on the screen, I'm telling you, you could do the dance right outside the car in the middle of, uh, in the middle of nowhere, which I have been observed doing that and <laughs> it didn't go over real well. So uh, we want greater user satisfaction. This is not usually something that, I mean, this is something Agile talks about, but on my side of the house, it's not usually something you think the guy who's used to be the dreaded IT guy uh, you know, talks about, but we want our users to be happy with the system that they're going to use. We want them to be happy with the tablet choice they have. We want them to feel like it's not a burden to put this information in. And it's so simple that, in fact, we get all of the data that we want. And obviously, it needs to be affordable uh, and, and accurate. So uh, we've been using different types of devices, trying to get through uh, some test modules. Uh, some of them are better than others. We have environmental concerns. There's a lot to talk about there, but it started in 2016. We started realizing that we wanted to do something a little bit different. We talked to Agile about it. We sat down, drew it all out on a bunch of whiteboards, had Agile come in to visit with us. We took them into a field test scenario, and actually, uh, I said yesterday, we drove them to the Louisiana State Penitentiary. We didn't make them go inside, but we, uh, we had them right outside there, and we were showing them that we could not create work orders with a GPS reading or any, any actual device help from where we were. So that was kind of the basis that we started on. So we've been uh, doing some testing of betas in 2017. We're projected to move forward into 7.3 by June 15th, um, and then it's, it's mobile work manager time. So we're trying to get from that to this. Really, to me, it feels a lot more like we're trying to get from that <laughs> to this. Um, and I, I'm not kidding about that in any way, shape, or form. It feels like that to me. So what have we achieved so far? We've been dealing with progressive versions, getting a little bit better, um, doing continuous testing and improving our functionality as we go. Um, we've got successful asset recognition in the field. As I said before, I can stand next to a couple of signs and when it puts those dots on the map in front of me, it just makes me feel really, really good. Um, and what we hope is that we'll have uh, an increase in data accuracy, we'll eliminate errors, we'll have a lot more user activity uh, and improve overall user satisfaction. So we'll be rolling out soon to a maintenance unit, not near you, but near me. And it makes me feel like this guy. <laughs> we'll be around. I'll be happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. Thank you. <laughs> That's, good That's good stuff. Oh, I hadn't seen that digital... Moses before, that's nice. Okay, New York State DOT, as I mentioned before, uh, they worked very hard to be here. Uh, they're not able to be here on it themselves, but we do have our program executive, Patrick Warren, presenting the Axiom Award on behalf of New York State DOT. I think it's more pressure to present for somebody else, by the way. Um, 
Well, first off, I want to recognize the New York State Department, uh, Srinivas Alimpeli, the Director of Structure, his boss, uh, Rich Marshall, Deputy Chief, Chief Engineer. We, on the New York side, we have a project manager that works for, with us just for Structure, Erika West Ice, Mark Straczynski, who's in charge of inspection, uh, Paul Campisi, who was in charge of inspection, and Jim Flynn, who actually started this project. I also want to take two seconds to recognize uh, the Agile people who uh, worked on this, uh, Mohamed Sire and PJ, uh, PJ Singh. They did some great work. <coughs> did some great work because they're nom nominated for an award. Um, so this is part of the structure management uh, module. It's an enhancement or uh, an extension of the module. It's not all the modules that New York is using. They're using bridge analysis, MMS, uh, facility management, uh, pavement, uh, I mentioned uh, bridge analysis, pavement analysis. Uh, so they're using multitude of modules. The main driver here, and pretty much the only driver, is public safety. The goal or the end game is to make sure none of those structures, you know, we're talking about over its overhead signs structures, none of the structure falls on the cars or people. Uh, so that's a pretty important goal. Uh, there's uh, underlining drivers, so they want a consistent system, so a consistent way of inspecting uh, structure, whether it's bridges, large culverts. <laughs> they want the system that uh, pr uh, supports workflow. Uh, that supports a uh, flag, so uh, defect reporting, all in a consistent manner. Uh, one of the interesting things is that they're using astro elements uh, to do the inspection and inventory. So it's all the same framework, whether it's bridge, large culvert. Uh, it does support the same framework in terms of QCQA. So uh, bridges go through a QCQA. QCQA in uh, New York and uh, flags uh, in, uh, sorry, large culvert and overhead signs and structure follows the same process. Very consistent, very easy for an inspector to move from large culvert to bridge over its <coughs> sign and structure. Uh, the, some fields are different. Uh, the inspection uh, criteria are different, but the way to input data and uh, interact with the system is exactly the same. Uh, the supporting technology for this is the WCC, which is their web content. So all the documents get stored to the web content. Uh, GIS, so everything is referenced on the on the GIS uh, you know, map, and also Jasper reporting, obviously, for uh, reports. There's 5,000 overhead sign structures inspected in New York. Uh, they go uh, on a maximum of a seven-year cycle. The, Actually, the inspection scheduling is much more complicated, which is really strange, but than bridges. It, there's so many rules there. It was, that was the biggest uh, difference between bridges and over its science and structure. Uh, so we can do uh, flags, we can do inventory uh, inspection, we obviously can do uh, the, you know, the inspection itself. Uh, and the drivers there were like the underlying driver besides safety, which was the number one, was uh, adhering to internal gui guidelines. So, you know, you can, for example, you cannot enter this uh, value in a field if, if you enter that value in the other field. Uh, tracking of fl uh, flags, uh, increased data quality, uh, adherence to business rules. So somebody cannot QC something that he, or QA something that somebody something that he already had QC'd and increase accessibility. So this system is available everywhere uh, as long as you have an online connection. Also, we have field data capability for offline if necessary. But most of the overhead sign and structures are in a densely populated area, so the offline capability is not such a big uh, priority or a big need. Uh, the other interesting thing about this project, it's actually live for uh, almost a year now. So we went live in June 2017. Inspection have been going on. <laughs> Inspection have been in inventory have been QC and QA. This is a live beast. It's going very well. Very few defects. Uh, I don't know if Rob is on the, in, uh, in the room, but I think we had four customer care tickets since last year regarding OSS. So that's really going smoothly. So this is uh, over at Science Structure. Uh, both New York and us, uh, we're really proud of the work we've done. It's a natural extension. Oh, the last thing I can mention is you can feed uh, the information from OSS into the structure analysis. So if you have a degradation 
curve for those structure. We can tell you when you what you should do, when you should do it. So same as bridge analysts or pavement analysts. So uh, if you're using the, the structure theory, you can feed it into the analysis theory. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Yeah, there's a lot happening up in New York State DOT. That's uh, that's that's wonderful. Okay, uh, next we have Alex Calvillo with Oklahoma Department of, of Transportation. Uh, very happy. I was recently the beneficiary of being at a conference that Alex chairs the Western States Maintenance Group, and he just does a great job. Thanks for being here, Alex. I want to start off by saying uh, recently ODOT changed our logo. <laughs> just so you guys know, know here in Austin that we're no longer that... Uh, logo you have. We're uh, the Death Star. And so for all my fellow Star Wars fans, especially the ones in Wyoming, my uh, employee number right now is TK421. I'm going to try. Uh, I've seen some really good presentations so far, which is fantastic because none of them look like they were anything like this I'm about to do that may or may not have been finalized at 1030 last night. Um, I want to talk to you about what we did for training. We, I got a really cool name, user, user Satisfaction Design, but really it's just the training program we came up with for RMS. And what I really like the most about it is that it was just us trying to find a solution to a problem. I'm an engineer, I like pictures. Anyone know what this is, basic learning curve? If you've heard me talk about data before, then you'll hear me say that this is when we went live, this is about two years later, and then the data started getting better because the users were learning more how, to, how the system works. The, the thing that executives don't like is that there's about two years of data that I honestly will tell them I throw out. Now, that's theoretical. The truth is, that's what it looks like. And that's where our challenge was in training our users, was that we kept having to start over. People retire. We get new employees, people get promoted, and there's always a need to start the training over again. So how do you get that going? I'll go over just a few of the bullet points. The number one thing that we have to remember, uh, we realize in Oklahoma, is that our employees are our best assets, just like a piece of equipment, just like a road, and just like an asset, they have to be maintained through training. Now, I didn't come up with a lot of this. I'm just the guy who gets to talk about it. So the first thing we realized when you're trying to, to improve upon your assets, you need to build user trust. When you're talking about road workers, and a lot of you are in maintenance, you understand that they, I'm 20 years in the central office, then build people only trust their own kind. It's just the way that the nature of, of these geniuses. So we had to build trust by bringing one of them in. We need, just like any a successful project, you need a champion. We found someone, Stephanie Richardson, you've all probably met her, uh, to come in and really take over and plan this out. And a lot of these are celebrations of her ideas. We started with one day classes, not one day for the whole system. There's a lot to cover. We had one day for all of our modules. So you have one day on roadway, you have well, one day on getting started, one day on roadway, one day on bridge, one day on facilities, one day on warehouse. I'm already filling up a week here, by the way. We do it. It's about three days a week. Sometimes we do it for two weeks. The one thing that we learned after the first round or so was don't forget the reports because all of our users kept calling in going, how do I get a report to do this? How do I get a report to do that? And we started off by just doing reports for like the last 15 minutes of every class. Now we have a one day on reports. This was a great idea that really is still working for us. Bypass the help desk. Don't, don't let, when a user has a problem, let them know. Don't call it the help desk. Don't email helpdesk at odot.org. We created a um, dedicated email group. We called it the ramp project back then, so it's ramp at odot.org. But whenever a user has a problem, we tell them to email that. That comes straight to us. That comes straight to our office, the maintenance office. One of our administrative staff answers it, sends the problem to who it needs to go to. And I have create a phone option on there, which is just Stephanie's phone. That's how she wants it. I, I didn't make, you know, I didn't say they're going to call you. But 
you go back to the concept of creating user trust. It's not like they're getting that strange person that logs a ticket number and then emails them through some automated system. It's the same people that trained them as answering the phone, answering the emails, and you're getting that one-to-one -one relationship. So when we talk about one-to-one -one relationships, that's what we have to really focus on. We can create one-to-one -one support. Now, that's great in theory, but how do you do it in today's day and age? Because when you've got a problem with a user that needs to get their time in right now, and they're 120 miles away in the panhandle of Oklahoma, a lot of the problems that they'll tell you is uh, you can't figure out what they're talking about. Of course you can't figure out what they're talking about. They don't know. That's why they're calling you. So we figured out that everybody has Microsoft Link. Some of you all call it Skype, depending how rich your state is. And <laughs> we were talking about this last night. There's a great feature in there when you chat with somebody that you can click a button and then you can see what's on their screen. So that's really helpful for when you want to say, hey, walk me through your problem. Stephanie realized that you can click another button and if they give you permission, you can take over their screen. I think the, the phrase was, here, let me drive. And so you've got a user with a one-to-one -one problem, you've got them on your screen and you can sit there and click around, you get those aha moments, makes everything worth it from hundreds of miles away. We talked about dinner last night and it's, it's one of our best tools. And I'm sure all of you have it already. Now, the last thing that's really paying off, user feedback, simple surveys. And I say simple surveys when I'm saying, our first survey had three questions on it. And we probably took away pages and pages of information that made our daily, weekly lists of things to take out. I call it our, our first top three list. Just tell us what your problems are. And some of them really seemed kind of out there, but as we talked about them, shared, we came up with really great solutions. And we'd always take them back to the users. And I found out later that when you do it like this, you're still maintaining that one-to-one -one relationship. You're still maintaining that trust from within and your users are learning. And that's when it comes down to at the end, we, we realize that this is working because you, in the end, you just got to care about your folks. And that's what we do. So we've been live for eight years now. I will still throw out the first two years of data just because going back to the learning curve, that's just the way the science of it all is. But through these methods that I'm telling you all about now, the data is good. My challenge now is just making something out of it because I have so much of it. And that's the real reward of a good training program. Call us any time. We've already, I'm trying to keep Stephanie from, going, from moving to Minnesota right now. Thanks, guys. Um, <laughs> this isn't hard. Uh, I'm glad to be able to share it with you all. But if you're having a problem with training, please talk to us because this, is, this isn't hard. It's, you got to care. And that's all I got. Thank you. Good job, guys. Thanks. All right. We have used uh, a lot of the uh, anecdotes and other uh, with other uh, discussions about uh, Oklahoma's training. I know that last user conference that was also very well received. So thank you. Now, uh, TextDot. Uh, TextDot. This is uh, uses uh, maintenance and pavement management. This is going to be discussion about the pavement analyst and Jenny. Jenny, there we go. Jenny Lee is going to come share with us what they're doing at the uh, Texas Department of Transportation. Jenny. Hi. So good morning. I'm here to present our effort to do a four-year payment management plan and using Agile's payment uh, module. All right. So the uh, initiation was uh, by our legislative requirement called Rider 55. So the goal for us is trying to have a system in place which can help our district to develop a comprehensive uniform payment management plan, which is uh, project specific and financially constrained. So the requirement require TechStyle to be able to report the predicted performance based on the planned project. 
Before we had a system in place, we have a legacy mainframe system, and the legacy mainframe system is not very user friendly, and it did not have that analytical portion and mapping functionalities. So in addition to the mainframe system, we had our standalone mapping uh, software, which is called MapZapper, and we also have another standalone uh, program, which pulling project from a different database uh, and database into one place. But you know we still cannot do the prediction, and we have to contract with our university and for them to do the prediction for us. So in order to really meet our you know legislative requirement, we have to have those several systems in place. Um, we worked with Agile in the last uh, since 2014. We have an 18 months project with Agile to implement system. So our goal is once we have a system in place, we would like have one shop for all. So we have one system which can pull the project from a different system, and we can have very easy to use mapping functionalities. We can have the system providing the tool the district use can go in there and run different scenario analysis to see what the system recommended project. Uh, in addition to that, we want the system have very good reporting mechanism. Uh, no matter they're just a, a district user or they're district engineers or even our administrations, they can go in and easily pull a mapping out, any of a reporting out, and to can briefing whoever needs the information to the elected officials or any of the general public. So that is our goal for the new system. Uh, in order to really implement that during the, the phase, and we designed the system interface with our design construction system and with our maintenance management system and also crash data uh, database. So once we, we are interfaced with those, the data can put into the payment analyst. And we did develop, we did put in our deterioration models and decision trees into our optimization model so users can run the scenarios. In addition to that, we know the mapping is really important for the users. So we work really hard and very closely with the implementation team to make the mapping portion are very easy to use. The users can just click the button, they crop to their county or their district or the maintenance sections. And they click another button and bring on the pre-created map, and then they can just see over there. There's a no requirement regarding the GIS background or experience at all. So if they want to print a map, that will be another button click, they get a PDF map. So they can take it and to show anybody. So I think the mapping really play a very important role to the success of the project. Like what I discussed, we, uh, it took us 18 months to work with the Agile team to make the payment analyst alive. But for the, year, for the four year plan effort, this is an annual process. Normally, districts start using the, the system working on their four year plan starting in the January. And they need to bring their plan to uh, one of the review team uh, in the first two weeks of June. The plan reviewed by the committee and uh, like what I emphasize, the mapping is really important. The mapping will show whether you planning, you think your maintenance effort with a regular, you know, planned project. If they didn't do very good uh, prep work for the seal code, it will show on the map. If there's a section which has very bad scores and there's a no plan project for the next four years, they will be questioned. What is the reason why you didn't plan anything? So I think mapping is really the key for the project. Uh, we do using the system to run the predictions and we publish the final report by the August 31st. So the process has been uh, ongoing for two years. We implement our system in 2016. This is our uh, second year to use it. We have very good feedback from the district. They are happy to use the system to be able to run the scenarios, to pull uh, maps out and review their projects. 
achievement uh, I'm talking here is we we have our goals at the beginning and we think we are able to really meet all of our our uh, scope our goals at the beginning uh, for the users and they can really pull the project out and they can talk and on and off for the different layers they can see different project on top of the scores and their traffic level very easily. And then the users can also run the scenarios. Any user can do that. It's not just our central office. So any user can go run the scenarios. And then if they don't like the results, they can go back to the DCS or uh, uh, MMS and make changes and go back, rerun their optimization. And they can see the predicted performance right there. So. For the reporting, and we do have those uh, reporting too, which has the bar charts, you know, tablet format. After they run the scenario, they can click run report, and which will show uh, their predicted performance. They can compare by the district, by county, and by the maintenance section for uh, treated lane miles uh, predicted performance. It's right there. So the results is we, the, the system allows the district and the regions to appropriately uh, allocate their resources through the long-term planning. In addition to the effort, and this year we just implemented a new thing, which is to uh, improve our work history data. In the past, we've been really struggled to do that. And since we have this new process in place in the payment analyst, we did a one, we added one new functionality, which is bring on the last year's plan project into the system automatically as part of a four year plan. We've been receiving very good feedback from the district. So I will say this, the system has been in place for two years. Uh, we did a before and after comparison. Before we had a system in place, we saw all the planned project normally for the year one is only 12% of our network has planned a project. But after the system in place, we pull the data up and look at it. We have 18% of the network which has a planned project. We see that 6% increase of the, the planned project. So I know there's a lot of factors into you know, why there's 6% difference. But if we assume there's just 1% of that is due to the new system help the district better planning their project, maybe we're talking about $55 million better utilized to maintain our network. That's one thing. The second thing I want to share with you before we have this system in place, we only have about 100 users statewide. They're mainly payment people. And after we have system in place for two years, we already have almost 600 users. Those users are not just the payment people. We talk about people are working in planning, working in design, and even total managers start using our system. To us, it's a great sign saying it's good customer satisfaction. So that's all I want to present. Thank you. Great job. Great job. Wow, those are some pretty impressive numbers right there. OK. So that is um, what we're going to do now. That is the, 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 those are the seven nominations. And as you can tell, each of them have their own story. Each of them have their own value areas. There are, every one of them is awesome. and. Uh, Really, just I, I admire so much the work and the effort, the thoughtfulness about going into each of those and sharing them with us. I want to go back and just kind of, I'm going to bring up the seven again, and I'd like to spend a few, few minutes, just allow the clock to tick for about three or four minutes, maybe even talk amongst yourself if you want, to try to bring this to life so we can kind of revisit mentally what's happening. So if we could just raise up the music just I want three or four minutes I want people thinking about and reflecting on the presentations themselves. And I'm going to go back to I'm going to go back to the list, and then we're going to talk about the voting. So let's just take a few minutes and think about the, each one of them, go back and reflect. 